this particular global nightmare would truly come from the heavens. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and the heaven departed, and the kings of the earth hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Objects falling from heaven are mentioned more than once in Revelation. In the book of Revelation, John is seeing what appears to be, in a vision, all these stars falling from heaven. It could very well be the massive meteor shower or massive meteor impact or massive asteroid impact on planet Earth. John's vision is rooted in the real history of comets and meteors striking our planet. Throughout history, phenomena in the sky, especially comets and meteors, have been deeply unsettling to human beings. During biblical times, only one power could cause the stars to fall. The most obvious explanation is that God is doing something to express his displeasure. Biblical scholars have discovered a word that's mentioned several times, one that ties directly to the prophecies. It's a star that derives its name from a plant with an appropriately bitter taste. Wormwood. When the third angel blew his trumpet, a large star fell from the sky. The star was called Wormwood. Could the Wormwood prophecy be fulfilled by an asteroid heading towards Earth? Wormwood is a scary prophecy because it does such damage, killing so many people and so much plant life and so much animal life. It's clearly something to be so huge it'll be trackable by modern technology. What religion has interpreted as prophecy, scientists like Dr. Phil Plate now view as fact. Far and away the biggest danger from the sky would be an asteroid impact because if we wait long enough, it will happen. A big rock is going to hit the Earth. 100% guaranteed rock solid bet on it. There are meteors out there. They do hit the Earth periodically. Meteors large enough to cause serious damage hit um, every century or so. Can an asteroid hit the Earth and destroy everything? The signs already surround us. A chunk of iron, probably about 50 yards across, slammed into the desert out there about 50,000 years ago. The amount of energy that was released, probably something like 20 megatons, which is 20 million tons of TNT exploding all at the same time. The evidence is clear. An asteroid collision could happen. So it's not a question of if, but when. The Arecibo Observatory has been tracking objects in our solar system since 1963. It is still the largest telescope on the planet. Unlike optical telescopes, radio telescopes like Arecibo make their observations electronically, similar to how radar works. We have a one megawatt radar system, possibly the most powerful radar system on Earth, that we use to track asteroids and get very precise information about the trajectory of these asteroids. And therefore, we can indeed improve our knowledge of the orbit of these objects, and we can tell whether an object poses a danger or not. What they're finding is startling to religious and scientific communities alike. The objects that are dangerous to us are the ones that are big enough to do substantial damage, uh, those are taken to be the ones that are sort of 500 feet across and larger. Of the 500 foot size, there's 10,000 to 20,000, I'd say. And we know where maybe somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of those are. By a conservative estimate, 7 to 14,000 unaccounted asteroids pose a threat to Earth. One as small as 100 yards across can still destroy a city the size of Tokyo. If one of these asteroids fulfills the Wormwood prophecy, if it is one of the seven signs, it would be an apocalypse unlike anything else in human history. If you have a, an asteroid that's a couple of hundred yards across, it's the size of an entire football stadium, and it comes in, it'll pass through the Earth's atmosphere and it gets very hot. 
So if you were standing, say, in New York City and it were going to impact there, you would look up and you would see this huge ball of light going across the sky. You would feel the heat from it. It would be like standing underneath an extra sun. As the Wormwood asteroid gets closer, the heat will intensify. It would get hotter and hotter and hotter, and it would be like sticking your head in the oven and turning it on broil. You would actually catch on fire. The buildings would be set on fire. Within seconds, every building in Manhattan will be set ablaze. But the fire won't last long. That fire would be put out almost instantly when the rock actually hit the ground. The Wormwood asteroid will gouge out an enormous crater. And there would be a huge shock wave which would just knock down buildings for miles around. The pressure wave, the heat, and all of this together would probably completely destroy Manhattan Island. Wormwood hits with such incredible impact that a third of all marine life is destroyed and coastlines are destroyed. It poisons the sea, it kills people, it kills plants, it kills animals, and so uh, there's tremendous devastation, and it's, and it's global. Some of the most devastating human impact may unfold in the days and years after an asteroid hits, a phenomenon that's called impact winter. A lot of the ejecta, the material that's been excavated from the crater, can actually obscure sunlight. And enough sunlight can be obscured that you could actually shut down photosynthesis and uh, plants would die and the entire food chain would be disrupted. You're talking about deaths on an unimaginable scale, huge impact to the global economy, uh, tremendous amounts of areas where food won't be able to be grown. And so you're talking about long-term effects, not just the instant effects of the impact, but long-term effects that, that could go on for years. Men reason and men scheme. But the fact is, God's word says that many, many, many are on that way of destruction. Many there are. That is fearful. In a Gallup poll taken in the United States, less than 4% of Americans believe that they might go to hell. Not 4%, less than 4 And don't believe that they are going, they believe that there's a possibility they may go. Do you know what that tells me? There are many that are deceived. Forever, he whispers in wonder. The idea deepens, widens, and towers over him. The awful truth spreads before him like an endless overlapping cloud. Forever. When I put 10,000 centuries of time here, I will not have accomplished one thing, he thinks. I will not have one second less to spend here. As we see in Luke 16, when the rich man pleaded for a drop of water, so too this new occupant entertains a similar ambition. In life he learned that even bad things could be tolerated if one could find a temporary relief. Perhaps even in hell, he thinks if he could rest from one moment to the next, perhaps, perhaps it would be more tolerable. He learns though, as Revelation 14 tells us, that the smoke of his torment will go up forever and ever and that he will have no rest day or night. That's what the Bible says. Think about what that means, no rest day or night. Thoughts of this happening to people we know, people that are just like us, is too terrifying to entertain for very long. That's why we don't talk about it. That's why it's not a popular thing. That's why at that Christian college, they said in the lifetime of that institution, no one had ever subjected the student body to an entire 40-minute chapel like I'm doing to you this morning. I think that's tragic. The idea of allowing someone to endure such torture for eternity violates the sensibilities of even the most severe judge among us. We as humans can't entertain that thought. But our thoughts of hell will never be so unmanageable as its reality. That's worse than our thoughts. We must take the doctrine of hell seriously and make sure we are practically affected by it. A hard look at hell should alter your estimation of sin. 
For hell is the byproduct of a life that is lived and ends in its sin. We know much about hell. Look at our modern stories, our modern movies. Evil is throughout them because evil is part of our lives today. It's not something that we come into contact with, something that we experience on the outside. It's something that we live. Everyone knows the reality of hell, and there's no point in trying to deny it. One of the doctrines concerning hell, you don't have to believe in hell in order to go there. It's not a requirement. All that is necessary is death in the state of mortal sin. That is all that is necessary. And everyone who dies in the state of mortal sin, 